All right, we are live. So thank you everybody for joining us Friday. The today's the was it the the twelfth, right? We're a little late. Sorry about that. You know, sometimes in this um, and well, a lot of times things are delayed. We're working on a closing today. It's actually a creative finance deal that we're going to talk about next week. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining us. My name is Adam Levine. I am a private lender. Hard money lender, been lending for over a decade. We work with different buckets of capital. We work with institutional. We have private capital. We also have some other investors like family and friends that come on the deals with us. And I want to introduce you to Joe Sparta. Joe, Star, Joe Sparta is a friend of ours, uh, a dear friend, also an investor and one of our clients. And the reason why I want to have Joe come on to the stage with us is because we have some interesting deals that we've done through uh, my other company and we've done, I forget how many deals we've done the past year. And I know that we recently closed, we closed on a ground up deal for you where you were able to structure private capital, but the institutional capital. And that's what we want to talk about how you're able to, you know, you started out from you know your humble beginnings with your one flip. Now you've done over 30 flips and you just got into your first ground up deal, which is amazing. And then you're scaling up to get into commercial multifamily development. And the same logic goes for, you know, a single family, one to four family house, when you're structuring the capital stack or a, uh, a grad up multifamily development type of deal. Now, keep in mind that the numbers are just greater and you just have to understand the, the different types of um, loan programs. I mean, they, and I, I'll have Joe explain that to you. So Joe, sorry about that. So, so yeah, Joe, well, let's, I'll, yeah, yeah, go on. So th thanks for having me at, on Adam. I'm very, very excited to be here. Very happy to be here. You're definitely a good friend of mine. We've known each other for a while now and we've done plenty of deals together. Uh, plenty, probably close to a dozen now over the last uh, year or two. So, I'm very excited to to be on here and you know share as much value as possible. I uh, first of all, I'm a, I'm a general contractor and developer uh, located in New Jersey, focusing primarily on northern and central New Jersey, and we're also doing deals uh, outside of New Jersey now as well, actually. Uh, but yeah, started in you know 2018. I was doing my uh, you know graduate degree in physics uh, at the time, and you know had a flip going on, and you know I had then I had a second flip going on, and and it was going really good. So I said, all right, well, um, you know, physics is fun and everything. It's my passion. But, you know, when you're making, you know, 100K on one flip you, or you see the check coming in, uh, it's tough to uh, say no to that. So I decided to go full time in 2019, uh, open up, opened up my own general contracting business, uh, hired day labor crews, um, just started managing the construction pro uh, process, being very, very hands on, being there daily, almost like a full time job at some point. And um, from there, just having that competitive advantage of being my own general contractor, having my own day labor crew, so I was able to save a lot of money. I was able to do uh, a lot of flips of scale compared to some other uh, people in the market, just because there's not a lot of deals in that market. Uh, so yeah, I got I got really active there, um, a full time 2019. Been doing it since till now, and uh, you know, sort of transition to multifamily developments as well that that we can we can get into. So interesting, right? So you study physics and you probably were watching uh, one of those TV shows late night, right? About how you could, you know, get into real estate. And, you know, so I, I, I've heard a lot of people. So let's talk about your first deal, right? I mean, you're, how old were you? So um, 2018, so I was about 27. Okay. Now, how'd you put it together? Like, did you, because the whole topic is, a lot of people want to get into real estate and there's always, there's always ways to put together deals. And I know that you're, you're really good at this. I mean, you're really good at bringing in private body partners and coming to people like us to bring you the institutional loan, or we can provide the, the private money as well for the, you know, for the, you know, the capital stack, you have your first loan, maybe up to 90% or 70% to start out. And now you're up, now you're that 90, 100 client. And for everybody to know, when I say 90, 100, meaning when, when Joe's, when Joe wants to come to us for a loan, let's talk about a standard loan. He 
now has the experience of completing, let's say, um, six similar deals. He's way past that. So he qualifies for that 9100 meeting. He puts down 10% on the purchase. He gets 100% construction up to 70% of that to repair value. That's not including any of the gap funding, such as a, um, a business, a secure business like credit or any type of um, private partner. And so let's talk about your first deal, right? How'd you put it together? Was there any, you know, like, let's talk about that. So yeah, humble beginnings. I was a, you know, still a college student at that point um, and really had no capital, right? So I actually, you know, I had a lender, you, what you would call a 203K. That was my first loan, never doing that again. Once and done, took a long process, about four, four months to close actually. Four, um, it's a full back loan. Oh yeah, it's a lot, it's a <laughs> lot of stuff, uh, very slow, but um, so I did that, I had no capital, right? So how did how I put the deal together? Well, I convinced a family member to go into a deal with me. Uh, so they actually put up the down payment, did all the finances. I did all the work. Uh, actually, I got very hands-on. I remember ripping up the garage asphalt with my <laughs> own hands, right? And, and a hammer, a small piece of hand. I didn't even have a real demo hammer. It took me the whole day. And, you know, they, they got very hands-on at, at some points, you know, just to make sure that, like the, pro the project got done on budget, uh, that it got done on time and it was done on time. Um, it was actually a very uh, big project for my first one too. You know, we did a, a full new roofing, full, the project, uh, got broken into a uh, matter of fact, uh, before closing, they sold the copper, all the electricity, plumbing, heating. So we ended up doing a full job, you know, <laughs> everything. So all the heating, all the electrical, all the plumbing, a uh, full roof job, uh, full oil tank removals. It was a big first project. It was a big first project. Yeah. It sounds pretty big. Yeah, the oh, oil yeah. tank. There will usually that's for more. You want to be more experienced when you deal with oil right. tank removal. I dove. Yeah, I've done a few. So I've dove uh, straight. You know, head first into the real estate game. You know, got my. Uh, actually, we we're pretty good on the budget, but um, you know, it was it was really like a, a huge learning process. A huge learning process. Just learned a ton. Learned a ton compared to like what I would have learned before from watching you know AGTV all day because you were you know alluding to you know watching these shows online. But you really get a, a big respect for just how much work it truly takes and all the back and forth communications with your with your contractor or your subcontractors or what have you. There's so much that has to line in place. It's really like, you know, it could be like a full time job just doing one flippy, especially if it's your if it's your first uh, if it's your first one. So, yeah, 100 percent. So you the first one was you had a 203K loan, which is full doc, right? You didn't go to a, a hard money lender or private lender back then. I mean, you had, so we'll talk about um, what this is 2019. So there was institutions. Back then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now that was full doc. I'm sure there was a lot of, um, it, you said four months to close because it, that now did, did you, if it's full doc, did you have income back then or did you have your partner, uh, your family there come as the guarantor on the loan to, qualify for that 203k use their income yeah so i used everything i used their income i used their capital um i did have some income as well and you know just made the deal happen you know where, where there's a will there's a way uh, yeah. you don't need capital to get started in real estate it definitely helps uh but i think you just need you know good you know head on your shoulders some hard work ethics and there's a lot of creative ways you could structure these deals that we'll, we'll get into okay. so that's actually an interesting point and so for investors out there, okay, where you're going full doc, right? Nothing wrong with it. It's just a lot of, it's just a lot to go through. And you did something creative, right? You brought in a loan, you brought in a private money partner and a loan sponsor, right? You're a young kid, you had some income, but prob I don't, I'm just, you know, when you're starting out, you're not going to have like that six figure income coming in and probably had, I don't know, student loans, probably your DTI is rather high. Um, that's what I'm thinking. So you brought you brought your family member to help put up the capital and to qualify for that loan, right? Which yeah. is, that's, so that's something that people could do. We do this all the time as lenders. We help, um, you know, we do this all the time where we'll bring in, you know, um, a private money, you have the deal, someone find you found the deal, right? And you were able to put everything together and you, then you you help bring in you help find the the bank and then your private money part of your family member was the the guarantor on there and put up all the money basically 
yeah so. yeah completely passive completely passive for them as like any investment should be if you're putting up the money you shouldn't be the one doing the work too um, yeah you know it's, it's it's really a team sport you have you know one person who's doing all, um, all the operations finding the deal and you have another person supplying the capital um and later on we can get into other stuff there's sometimes we have like you know a few partners on on one deal which is like you know for bigger deals but um yeah i ran i ran the acquisition i ran i ran the financing i ran the construction management uh pretty much everything so um and then completely so then, passive to the investor. And what so then you transitioned into they call hard money right and let's talk about that right so now did you still have the same private money partner like how do, how are you able to scale up because the reason why people are looking for this i would call it gator gapping you know for everybody that didn't watch the the prior episodes um we last week we spoke about um gator gapping which is basically something that i took from pace morby he came up with the gator method and gator gapping is something that to me it makes sense you're filling in all the gaps you're putting everything together what are the gaps a gap is well joseph's first deal he found the deal, but he didn't have the money, right? So he brought in a family member. He didn't have the income, or maybe he had some income, but he really needed that his um, family, his relative, to, to become a loan sponsor. Meaning they're signed, they're, they're coming on as a personal guarantor on the loan, right? He's filling in that gap. He didn't qualify, so he brought in that, and then he brought in the money, and so that's what we're talking about. We're filling in gaps, Gator Gap. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So the second deal, I, I brought in uh, a non-relative, um, an investor, basically, and it was exactly what you were referring to. So it wasn't a money partner. I said, "Hey, you know, it's my first deal. I got my, you know, cuts and bruises. I, you know, it is the business plan. It's a proven business plan. You can make money. You buy. You're buying under market value. You're renovating it and you're selling it for sometimes double the value, right? So uh, I ended up just getting a, a private money lender and I blended it with what you call institutional capital as well, a hard money lender. And uh, that private money lender essentially, again, completely passive, no work. They put up all the capital. They got, you know, some return on their capital as well that we structured, uh, you know, and everything done to return, everything done safely as well. And uh, that, that deal was, you know, pretty good deal. Uh, had a, a pretty big check coming in. So at that point, I was while I was doing my graduate degree studies, actually also out of state too. It was in Florida, <laughs> Florida State <laughs> University. I was managing a project that had, you know, someone kind of stop by every couple of times as needed, but I also managed most of the project myself. Uh, to be frank, you know, um, 90, 95% of the project management was on me. Um, but I was able to, you know, do the deal while I was doing my graduate degree in physics uh, in Florida all the way, you know, across, across states and you know, putting in like a hundred hour work weeks there. <laughs> that, was a, that was a lot of work. I put in 120 hours a week just for the graduate studies. And then basically uh, it was pretty intense. And then, you know, doing the flip on the side and I decided to focus my, all my attention, all my effort into real estate full time. Uh, after, after the deal was going, I saw that it was going successfully and everything. Uh, it made a lot of sense to just go and scale, scale that business up. So talk about filling gaps, right? So now there's another gap. Um, well, cost, right? So you talked about you became a GC, which is very interesting, right? So there's benefits of being a GC. And one of them is you can cut down on that cost of that. What is it? The, the GC, the generally, when you, when you hire a general contractor, you're paying them a market was like 20% and they're going to go get all the, you know, their labor and everything. But I'll let you take it. Like, that's another gap though. You're able to save on costs and really manage the project versus outsourcing it. And then you have that extra cost because now you got to pay someone else to manage it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the first project, I, I maybe I have high expectations, but I wanted the project to go a lot faster. Um, I was frustrated with some things. Second project too, I was also frustrated with the, with the process. Uh, even though that was a good project at the end of the day, I didn't have a lot of control. You know, you could kind of, you know, not really yell and scream, but just as a, use it as a um, uh, a metaphor. You know, you could complain all you want, whatever, but you don't have ultimate control over the whole process. So uh, I also saw that, you know, some things came up on the project, right? Which frankly were very expensive. So what did I do? I ended up doing it myself. 
<laughs> so that second, I was doing work myself on the first project. The second project, it was pretty complicated. Like, wouldn't recommend this. It was pretty complicated, like heating and plumbing job uh, work that needed to be done. And I already met my budget. So I said, okay, let me actually do this myself. And I spent, you know, several days doing, uh, you know, kind of trial and error, trying different things out. Uh, it was like the pipe was like a hundred years old. I couldn't get it loose. It's a steam pipe. It's the worst kind of piping to work with. <laughs> you couldn't get it loose at all. Uh, you know, I ended up hiring uh, day labor too to help me out. And that's really how I started my process as a general contractor. Just wanted as much control over the time, but also I wanted control over the budget because what ends up hurting a lot of people is something might come up. They're going above budget and maybe let's say they have a plumbing job and it's well, let's not let's not use plumbing but whatever the, the thing is they have like a 10 15 20 thousand dollar expense that comes up because they have to you know hire someone that's you know frankly very expensive and may, maybe it's an easy job or what have you let's say um uh something with the flooring something something you can take on so i don't really recommend you mess around with plumbing and stuff stuff like that yourself uh but if you understand you know, the plumbing, if you understand the electrical, you could save a lot of costs just by negotiating with the guys properly and knowing your your actual true cost and how much time it's going to take and that stuff. So there's really a lot of benefits to being your own general contractor. The downside is it really just takes a lot of time. Um, you know, it's almost like a full-time job too. So some of the people that I see that are able, sometimes in different markets, not necessarily in New Jersey, what I see in different markets is some people are able to scale faster. They have just one general contractor or, or a few that they rely on rather than doing it themselves. So it can become a distraction. So mm -hmm. uh, the pro is you, you can save on time. You, you have better control over the, the uh, uh, timeline or uh, the cost, excuse me, as well. And you, you, could, you get to avoid a lot of potential pitfalls. So what a lot of people do is they rely on general contractor and they lose money because that general contract is not as, as knowledgeable as they think they are. And I've heard some crazy stories, you know, just like the other week, I heard a story of they hired a general contractor who literally, this, you cannot make this up, uh, the found the basement is too short. So he, they wanted to make the found, uh, basement taller. So you're supposed to take from the from the ground, right? Take from the ground, take like two feet, two feet off the ground or whatever. And now you have a taller basement. But what the contractor did, <laughs> and this is funny, he actually started shaving off the actual structural joists huh. of the whole building from the ceiling. That's a big no-no. <laughs> you can't wow. do that. You cannot do that. But yeah, I, I hear a lot of nightmares about general contractors as people that will go into foreclosure because they hired the wrong guy. And that guy, maybe they tried to do the work with uh, the permit for the electrical and the plumbing, and they try to Maybe they try to do it themselves or they hire some other guy that's a hack. So you really being knowledgeable just helps in the other day. Even if you end up later on hiring it out, I'd always recommend just try to learn as much as possible. Get get the general contractor first time, get the general contractor second time, but try to pick up on it and then start doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the worst, if you have the time, the worst case scenario, you'll you know waste some time or anything. But the more you learn, the better you could actually manage the general contractor the better or the more likelihood you are into scaling into other things as well. Cause you're an actual operator. You can, you know, get into multifamily developments, single family developments, big conversion projects, rather than just relying on someone else to, to, to carry you. And, and, and that's actually an interesting point and sorry to cut you off. So another thing uh, you're, these are all focused in New Jersey. I don't believe we said that. So first of all, when you're a GC, another gap filler that actually helps you, in the, in the in the viewpoint of a lender, it actually looks better, right? That helps with underwriting. Okay, he's a general contractor, and it's viewed positively. So, for example, I'll give you an example, right? Let's say you want to do a flip, and you have no experience, but you're a GC. Well, that GC license will help give you a slight tad in leverage. Let's say you're at um, you got to put down thirty percent down on the purchase. Having that GC license will help you get an extra 5% leverage, okay? Another thing I want to point out, in Jersey, I'm sure you know, how hard was it to get a GC license? <laughs> really easy. <laughs> so anybody can become a GC. And 
that's a problem because it doesn't mean they have knowledge. They just have that license. There's like very little Barrett Edry in New Jersey, but I'll incredibly let you continue because I thought that, you know, no, I've heard horror stories too. That's <laughs> right. It's incredibly low. You, you know, you, you fill out an application, you, you know, open up your, your business, you pay maybe $145 or whatever the fee is nowadays or a couple hundred dollars at max and you're off, you're off to the races. You could hire subcontractors. Uh, you don't need to know anything really. Um, which you, you technically do because there's a lot of pitfalls, a lot of things that could go wrong. So, you know, you're technically you are a babysitter and it's really more like project management, but you can't project manage effectively if you don't actually know the trades. Mm -hmm. uh, so I found it very effectively, very, very effective for me to actually like try out some of the, the trades myself with my own hands to really, really learn at a, at a deep level and then hiring people, obviously, and managing them. I got to learn a little bit more every single day. So now I get to avoid, well, actually it's helped me tremendously now because I'm a builder as well. And I understand all the, all the trades, um, more or less. I mean, electrical, plumbing, mechanical, roofing, siding, because I've, you know, even did it myself. I've hired people, day labor, I've had to manage them, be on site, all that stuff. I had to learn everything myself because you can't manage people unless you really learn it yourself. Um, so there's tons of research, tons of benefits to it. Um, I think at some point, if you want to be a vertically integrated a real estate investment firm, development company, whatever you want to do. If you want to be vertically integrated, I, I definitely, definitely recommend it. hundred percent. That's actually a, uh, so for the audience that doesn't know what vertically integrated, it's basically you do everything in house. What happens is, um, Joe is, uh, he's a GC. So he's, he is the, he's the operator. He does everything. And a step further, I'm sure when, you know, I know investors, what they'll do is what they, they'll, they'll even, when you own rentals, they'll even open up their own property management company to manage their rentals versus outsourcing other people. So basically vertically, vertically integrated means you, you manage everything in house. You're not outsourcing to other counterparties such as property management, general contracting. And, uh, you know, I, a lot of times, like I'm sure you, there is exceptions, subs, right? You, I'm sure you outsource to a I do, I do all subs. Yeah. I do all subs. Yeah. So, so, but you have your labor guys. Another benefit, I, I'm not. Just, I know a lot of other flippers because uh, you're doing scale. You're you're not like how many deals are you doing a month these days? Um, I mean, the market's signed up, and I'm more conservative. So right now, it's tough finding deals. I'm doing a couple of deals right now. Okay. So, so what happens is you have your labor guys. You don't have to go search for labor. You have them. You have your your sub as well. And the reason being because you constantly have work for them. Right. So you don't have to go. It's not hard for you to find as long as you have work. They're going to continue on your project. They keep on going to other projects. Yeah, exactly. I, that's something that's really important too. to. Well, first of all, you have the market has to be there. You have to be able to be finding good deals. But if you're finding good deals, you want to keep lining them up. So the more you're able to keep them employed, the, the more you'll you'll have more negotiating power. You'll have more control right over the timeline because you know, they're doing all your projects, you'll be your first priority. So when you call them and you say, Hey, look, I, I really need to get this done. Instead of them booking you two weeks later or giving you the runaround, you're their top priority client. So um, it really, really helps to, you know, be at scale in, in one single market. Uh, if you want to be, particularly if you want to be your own GC, if you're not able to get it at scale, you know, maybe just hire a general contractor um, or, or you can still sub it out. There's nothing wrong with that. It just helps a lot more, like as you said, to have multiple projects lined up for them. Okay, this is great, everybody. And please, if you have questions, please share them in the chat because I'm sure uh, we will we'll be Joe will be very happy to answer any questions you have. And please ask away. So now let's go into um, scaling, right? So obviously filling gaps. You're you're, you're a GC now. Um, you're full time. And now you, you start out with your um, two or three K loan. Then you got your, your relative, your next deal, you brought in a private lender, you blended it with institutional capital, your GC, your managing everything in house. So you're filling in those gaps. Now you're scaling, right? So let's, let's go into what, what we've been, what you've been up to now, because how many flips have you done? It's like 30 something already. Yeah, we've, we've done a pretty good amount. So, I mean, right now we're scaling into multifamily developments. So we're under contract on a 160 unit in North Carolina. 
Mm -hmm. And um, also uh, flex industrial development, 86,000 square feet. And then we also actually had a four unit uh, signed LOI, but something happened in an in interim, long story, uh, with uh, nothing from our side, from the seller side. So mm -hmm. we are probably going on the contract on a similar lot, actually, luckily, because the broker said he has something else. Um, it's almost the same deal. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this, yeah, so this is good. This is good stuff. Um, and the same logic comes when with commercial development. So I just want to step back real quick. Okay. So keep in mind, like you didn't just start out with small little flips to get to now you're doing, what did you say? A hundred, you know, something unit, ground up, multifamily, flex space. You, you start out with small little rehabs and then you, your budget started getting bigger and bigger. You know, I, I believe the last, um, well, the one in Morristown, that was a budget of 150000 Let's talk about that real quick, okay? Because the reason being is because now we blended institutional with private capital. I want, if you could highlight that deal, because I know that deal is still actually a live deal right now. Yeah, yeah. So that one's a pretty sweet deal. You know, bought it at 370 um, ended up coming in with none of my own capital. We blended institutional capital, um, private capital, as you say. And, um, you know, should be exiting at 700. So I got almost half the value. Um, you know, we make some money on the construction. We make some money on the sale. So at the end of the day, it's kind of a win-win when you're on your own, you're your own GC as well. Cause you get, you get some income in, in the middle, which is very important because you're not seeing any income for like six, nine months, mind you. So, um, yeah, that's kind of like a management fee a little bit. Um, that's, so that's actually, sorry to cut you off. So that's actually a good point. And. I'm glad you touched on that. So another benefit of being a GC is when you're flipping a house, you have no cash flow until you sell the property. But now you actually have cash flow because you could pay yourself um, basically what they call it. You're, um, you're, padding the budget. Yeah. you're padding the budget and you're building in your profit into the budget. So every draw, you could actually pull out some um, money for yourself to pay yourself and your, and your crew. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, if you if you're able, if the deal makes sense, most importantly, <laughs> if the deal makes sense, you have a little padding there. You know, you can if you're you know doing this full time, it's important. So you got uh, your mortgages you have to pay. But uh, anyways, when you're buying a deal, you're supposed to have that money before, right? You, mm -hmm. you want to have six months reserves, and the lender is going to make sure you have those reserves uh, and everything like that. But if you're able to keep your cost low, you have like very quality, uh, good quality subs. Right. Yeah. You put in, you know, a little bit of a GC fee, if you will, uh, um, for, for managing your own project. And that might actually be very important later down the line. Right. Let's say you go over budget, which is going to happen. You have that padding. So either way, you want to put right. some padding anyways, because what kills a lot of deals or when I see a lot of people going to foreclosure is because they either under budgeted or they right on budget. Maybe they have it perfectly on budget. But what, what happens in real estate? You know, <laughs> cost overruns, time overruns, it's going to happen, right? So you mm -hmm. want to have some padding there, something that makes sense. And obviously your institutional capital provider is going to make sure that this is a good deal that you're going into and, you know, you're not under budgeting too much. They're going to make sure that you have actually a, a big gap between your purchase price and your sale value. Um, and frankly, also including the construction costs as well. Um, so they're, they're made, they're trying to make sure that it's a good deal, you know, but, uh, a lot of times, you know, they're not like looking at it through pins and needles, right. You know, they can miss something. So maybe you hire a general contractor and you don't notice that your budget is a little bit low and then you go above budget. I was just talking to one of my investors and I typically tend to have like uh, the same investor over and over, but this is a new guy that first time I'm working with and. He told me, he's like, hey, my GC is always over budget, 30, 60,000. I'm like, 30, 60,000? He's like, yeah. I said, <laughs> man, the good thing you have the most people, most people don't have the capital to go 30, 60,000 over budget. No. Right? Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of issues happen. So definitely you want to make sure you're very, very conservative. You have some padding there in the, in the budget. And then uh, just in case anything goes wrong. No, I, I think it's ingenious. Um, and I really... I think that's, you're sharp. So 
Now, one thing I want to step back on that is that refresh my memory because you would I I have to look again, but let's say your out of pocket cost might have been what was it cash to close, and then we gave you a second loan basically to this gap funding. That's what we did, and yeah. we covered your basically I believe like almost all your down payment money. You had very little money out of pocket. Yeah. And we, and then, um, yeah, we had like, I think multiple deals we've done like that. And so that's the part of the gator gapping, right? So you're the GC, you're managing everything in house. You came to, uh, you came to me and we saw the solution for you because you're, you have multiple projects going out once and for you to scale up, it's unless you have, uh, you don't have a limited amount of capital. No one does, right? So in order to scale up to do multiple flips, you have to find an, um, a private money partner. But what we did is we did everything in house. So we gave you the institutional loan, and then we gave you the gap funding. So we kept it. Um, we we made it your life a lot easier. So you didn't have to go search for that capital, and we made the economics of the loan attractive to you. And you're and you have a, a a greater profit margin because what is like what's your savings that you're being a GC? Because I know we have a, a question here from Cheddar uh, back regarding your 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 budget. So um, I believe your budget on um, fourteen uh, Hillary was uh, was in was um, was one hundred fifty thousand, right? Like one hundred fifty or something like that. And then what was I guess your um, your 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 budget your um so, your uh your gc um fee like how much of um it, what, i'm trying to think i'm drawing up like yeah, how much of a, like 30k probably like thirty thousand dollars yeah so if, what do you factor like um so what percentage i like to talk percentages of that's, it that's like 20 percent. so this one was a really really good deal where we had yeah had the space to kind of make sure that it was actually important to have that space too because we had some over uh time overruns with the with the city <laughs> they took a lot longer than expected uh to get to get us our zoning approvals uh with that one that was really just a, a simple a simple thing it's not like you're actually changing the zoning but uh they they did have to do a zoning application just to get the permits um uh for something minute uh, very, very minor. It's just for adding the AC in the, in the backyard. So. <laughs> yeah. Just so. to answer, Cheddar, what is your average budget per se? Yeah. So, yeah. So the average budget is typically like 60K, um, 70K, depending on if it's like a, a cosmetic flick, uh, flip, excuse me. It's usually around like 60K. So uh, a lot of deals, I'm running quick numbers. I just put hey, 60K here, 60K there. Uh, I'm also running numbers in, in depth, but you know, if I'm looking at a general easy renovation, that's what I'm budgeting for. Um, but you know, that 60 K for you, I've had people bid like 110 K or 115 K and 20 K and I tell them, no, thank you. So, <laughs> so, um, you know, your costs can vary and especially depending on who you're working on. So you want to get, you want to get multiple bids too. Um, or just run your own sub crews or, or what have you, but you're even with sub crews, you're still going to be talking about a high cost. So, so for like for Morristown, I spent, you know, almost 60 K for plumbing, heating, and electrical. Oh, you it's, know what? Watch it's this. not, it's not cheap, right? That's not cheap. Just for these three items. Yeah. So I just actually put cheddar on the, on the big screen. Oh yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Cause before I didn't. Thank you. Know. Wow. Yeah. That project was, um, where was that again? That was Jersey City, that one. Yeah, so that one was Jersey That was a, a quick, easy project for me. And, um, you know, very easy project. It was like, I think we, uh, the day that we started, we had it done like one or two months or something like that. So uh, pretty much cosmetic, actually. There was a little bit more too, but, um, you know, very good project for us. Nice, quick, easy money. And then we sold it like really quickly. Put on the market, instantly had like an offer in like two days. So, <laughs> so that's interesting, right? So, oh, here we go. So another thing is like, you said you're bidding out, right? And typically, let's say that one project was a $60,000 budget. Let's say someone has to outsource to another general contractor. What, what would their cost be? You said 100000 or something like 
like that. It could be a hundred thousand. I mean, what general contractors are usually going to do, and depends. <laughs> really, really, like, it depends could vary wildly, but they want to do like twenty percent mm -hmm. fee on top. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. I know people that are getting rehabs done on fifty, and they're charging like one hundred twenty, double mm -hmm. the profit margin. So. Uh, it could vary widely. It could vary really, really widely. So uh, there's no like clear and cut rule, not at all. When you get into like bigger development deals, it's pretty clear cut. They all it's like usually standard, depending on the size of the development. If it's 10 million development and above, or you know one to two mil or whatever. So it, it really depends. But you could see like GC fees are 10 percent, typically mm -hmm. 15, 20 percent, even sometimes lower if the budget is really high. Say so you're doing like a you know 50 mil project them will charge maybe a lower fee mm -hmm. versus like you know obviously like a two more project they're gonna charge you closer to like a 20 percent fee so it could all vary regarding your question about like rehab estimation a uh, rehab estimator pro i don't recommend these these uh uh softwares they're usually very inaccurate i don't recommend them at all i'd say stay away do your own estimates so let's say um if you can really because a lot of times you don't have the knowledge but if you do have the knowledge you know you go on home depot estimate some of the um uh materials yourself uh we talk talk to subcontractors tell them hey can you help me out with this how much do you think in material that we have or just give me a bid for labor and material the best thing i would suggest is to just contact the subcontractors let's say you have a flooring subcontractor electrical subcontractor you're contacting them and say hey uh how much can you do this for right um these software softwares are usually not that good uh, in my opinion they're inaccurate but maybe you could use them as a starting point. I wouldn't say uh, I wouldn't say otherwise. That's a great point. I mean, you really need to know knowledge of what things cost. And in order to gain that knowledge, it just takes experience. There's no way around it. You got to be in the trenches and, and learn. And yeah, thank you. Uh, and <laughs> we spoke, Anthony and I spoke this morning. I actually, actually at the gym and we were, we were talking. It was, you know, it was very productive. It was, it was a very good conversation we had. Um, so let's go back now. So now that that other Jersey City deal we did, where we did the walkthrough, we also gave you gap funding. So what other resources do you use? Do you um, have you tapped into uh, business credit cards or a an unsecured business line of credit yet, or is that something that you are looking into? I haven't or? I haven't used that stuff yet. Um, mm. you know, I have like the American Express kind of like a credit card. But I have not actually not used a business line of credit or anything like that. Uh, there's actually, um, you know, I did get an offer before from an SBA, SBA lender. So one thing I would say is, uh, but the thing is, I had my um, uh, flip going on, and on a bank statement, they don't want to see that. So <laughs> yeah. So if you own GC or whatever, don't have um, your your don't have any type of flip transaction on there. But uh, yeah, I was gonna get a pretty good amount, like 130 thousand at the time. Um, a couple years back. So I would say should look into SBA lending or uh, if you're your own GC or if you have some kind of recurring in uh, income that's a uh, revenue, I should say, that actually qualifies. Look into that. Um, it's actually not as hard as you think, but they want to see the last three months bank statements. They want to see consistent revenue coming in, uh, consistent cash flow coming in as well um and you know these can be very very good options to to look into but uh my main thing is I've, I've always used private capital so i never had to worry and pretty cheaply too you know just small interest rates and stuff like that so i never had to actually go and really try too hard with the other options like business lines or credits so that's an interesting uh thought right so you you're talking about sba loans that's a it's a small business, a small business administration. Um, they're giving you a loan to your business that because you're a general contractor, right? And so that's so that's a loan for that. That's actually interesting that you could. Add, so that's another like a perk of being a GC is that you could tap into those resources of getting a, an SBA loan. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's there's different ways to you know I've I've seen some guys they pull like 30, 60 k on a credit card or what have you. Uh, but my favorite is get the private capital. Um, I don't really, you know, it's it's something you can do, but I'm not crazy about it. I, I would say, you know, go into that kind of stuff if you don't have access to private money. 
but you know you should be working on your branding you should be working on actually being an experienced operator uh, if you're you know getting your own gc license and stuff like that and you go on day in and day out and you're showing yourself managing these projects you're going to attract private capital sooner or later right you could post yourself on some facebook groups say hey look this is what, I, what i'm working on post on your social media hey this is what i'm working on and then really just kind of broadcast your life kind of you know not as a tv show but you're re- literally just giving updates right mm-hmm. you're giving updates kind of the same thing you might see in agtv hey this thing came up that thing came up you know imagine this uh contractor this issue came up here's how i resolved it here's what i learned if you're documenting your journey um i think sooner or later you'll people are going to catch on like hey this is a smart cat or this guy knows what he's doing or you're frankly you're garnering attention right so you want to be sure. posting your your posts if you're on instagram you want to be posting your reels consistently and and networking as well going to investor meetups networking with you know uh, friends and family or whoever you think might have some capital and say hey look you know i have this you know really sweet project i'm buying it for 300k and you know we're under contract and i think i could sell for six hundred thousand. they're like oh wow okay well and then you tell them hey here's here's what's in it for you here's how you could secure your capital here's why i think it's safe you know i have this institutional capital they love this deal you know they're they're gonna you know put up you know, 70% of the money, 60% of the money, 90% of the money, whatever, what have you, um, would you like to, you know, fund some of the gap? And here's the ways that you can be secure. Maybe we'll partner. Maybe it's, well, we don't partner. We'll structure it this way. Uh, but there, you should be able to, you know, attract private capital in, in any deal that, that, that you do. Um, and I would say, you know, credit card is maybe something that you can explore on the side, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't make it, you, you know, your main way of uh, attracting capital or anything like that. Um, I, I don't, frankly, I don't know how, how well skills. I think it's. Yeah. Not, well, you, so another thing is you're talking about Home Depot. You, you don't have a Home Depot credit card or. I have a pro account with Home Depot. You have a pro account. So that's another I have, benefit. I have, I have multiple credit cards with them. Yeah. Commercial Got it. Account. So it's a business credit card, right? Business. Yeah. Okay. So the good benefit, the benefit of being um, a business, like I said this before, um, please do not. Well, my recommendation um, is I would avoid putting your rehab monies on your personal credit card. The reason why you go to business is because this is show up on your personal credit report. So it's not going to ding your credit where meaning you're going above that 30% utilization. I know we touched that on other episodes. Another benefit filling gaps is let's talk about that. Uh, was it the, the pro discount from um, from Home Depot. Only they're they're very useful. <laughs> yeah, you could have a large order. I've had orders, you know, I've saved like fifteen hundred, two thousand. Sometimes if you're doing a large order, and they add up, and you get perks too, uh, where you'll get like basically like a, a two hundred fifty dollars for free, five hundred dollars, a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand. I mean, they add up. They add up quick. So if you're doing, especially if you're doing volume, uh, definitely, definitely recommend a pro account. There's uh, so many different ways it can help you. If you're having someone, subcontractor, GC, whatever, ordering something, they could just do a text to confirm. You can confirm on your phone the order. You don't have to go there with the contractor. Or you don't, you know, it's really, really easy. Uh, it's a, at least if you're taking care of the material. If they are, you don't have to worry about that. But yeah, I definitely recommend having a pro account. And, um, you know, again, like just keep working, broadcasting yourself out there to attract capital. So if you're looking to scale into bigger stuff, like, you know, multifamily developments or what have you, you're learning the process of attracting capital versus if you're just focusing on like getting like, you know, these business lines of credit and stuff like that. And if you, if you're not like graduating, in my opinion, I would call it graduating to attracting private capital, you're not, you're not learning a very, very important skill of communicating with investors or just forming relationships with, with potential partners, investors, friends. Um, and you won't be able to, you know, scale into larger stuff because the name of the game in real estate is always OPM. I mean, billionaire real estate developers are always using OPM either way. So either uh, way, other OPM, other people's, people's money. money. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for that. Other people's money. So it's how you scale in real estate. And even if you have capital, you're still always using it no matter what, because you're able to do a lot more deals. If you have a billion dollars in the bank, you have a million, it doesn't matter. You're still going to always use OPM. Because in real estate is always about, and, and you have to do it safely, first of all, right? But it's always mm-hmm. about leveraging capital, 
right? Because your money goes a lot, a lot farther, you know, just with a bank, right? If you're just talking about like just one house, you're three axing how many houses you could buy just by using a bank, right? Putting 30% down. Uh, if you use an institutional partner for a fix and flip, right? You could go out and do, you know, five, six more times more deals, mm -hmm. right? If you learn how to attract private capital and let's say you want to do fix and flips at scale, you're only really limited by the number of houses that you find and in your ability to properly uh, manage the construction process, right? If you have, if you have access to that capital, you're not really limited by anything other than these two factors. Mm -hmm. right? That's, that's a good point. So, so just like here on this YouTube live, you're, you're branding yourself, you're marketing yourself. So, and that, that's a great point um, for raising capital is you're, you're posting your, your progress, you're posting your journey and people are going to, they're going to have an interest to learn more about what you're doing. And I'm sure people reach out to you like, how do I get involved or something like that? Right. All the time, yeah, all the time, yeah. I, you know, people, you know, will sometimes like they'll admire you. They'll leave you some nice comments. They'll, you know, I get a lot of support, you know, um, not that I'm a big like Instagram guy or anything like that, but people see what you're doing and they, they love to see what's going on. Right. They, they, they love to support you. Typically speaking, unless maybe you have a big social media following and you start getting haters, but people love what you're doing. They su always support what you're doing um, and they're interested to work with you. They're interested to learn more. Um, they want to network with you more. So putting yourself out there is very, very important, you know, for not just developing relationships and investors, but also like, you know, dealing with sometimes brokers, wholesalers that want to bring you more deals. They mm -hmm. see, let's see this question. Do you do cash out of equity? Is there a season and requirement before pulling cash out? I don't really focus on bird deals. Yeah. Um, so on bird deals, yeah, you'll buy a property. It depends on the lender. You sometimes there's a seasonal requirement. We actually wait six months. Correct. Uh, if, I don't know what uh, Levine Capital yeah, does. I, I can, I can answer. This is an easy one. And I, I'm dealing with, uh, sorry, my phone. <laughs> I have to, I'll call them back. Um, so actually we're dealing with a situation like that. Um, we're going to, we'll talk about this another time, but keep it very simple. Um, if you, let's say you buy a property for 400, Meanwhile, the as is value is worth 500. And we're talking about, let's say you buy it as a bridge loan, right? You're buying it and you're like, hey, I'm going to refinance into a, a, a DSCR loan, cash out. There's seasoning, right? Six months. You're correct. But in order to, in order to um, bypass that, meaning where you don't have to wait six months, you got to force equity. You got to put money into the project. You got to improve that property. And then, and then you'll be able to refinance at the, you know, the, the after repair value. So um, then you could, then you could refinance without any seasoning, as long as you could prove that you, that you put dollars into the property. The reason why is because um, lenders don't want investors to take advantage of buying properties significantly under market value without putting any improvements in and then just pulling their money out. Right. Like that's the logic. So they want to see you put money in. But that's a great question, though. Yeah, absolutely. And and let, let's touch over like, you know, scaling into bigger things, too. Correct. You know, so let's go. Let's go over the um the last deal we closed, because that was actually before we get to the larger stuff, because it keep in mind, like um it's the same thing that, that we'll, we'll go with that. So the ground up deal, right, that we did in Newark, right? So yeah. that was an interesting deal. And you talk about how you structured that because, because that was actually very interesting. Yeah. So the way we did is we brought you guys in. Um, you actually have very good leverage. It was 90, 90% LTC, I believe. Right. And um, we got uh, a partner to put down the uh, down payment and reserves. So the down payment was about 110,000. And then we put 70,000 in reserves. So uh, my investor, who was a partner, 50 50 partner, was basically all in 180,000 um, uh, for the ground up construction deal. So that one's a, a two family uh, ground up deal that's active right now, that's uh, uh, in, located at Newark, New Jersey. And, um, you know, pretty sweet deal, I would say. I, I had my construction costs uh, already, it was already set before the deal, but um, really, I'm, we're on budget, we're on time. So uh, we just broke ground actually recently. 
uh, waiting for a couple of things with the city. Uh, but we're, we're looking, actually, my goal is to be done in four months. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, so far, so good. Um, and, um, you know, I look forward to, you know, exiting this one and then probably do a lot more deals with, with my investor as well. Mm. And, you know, it's a win-win. The investor is completely passive. They're making, you know, a, a really good return uh, as a 50-50 partner. And then, obviously, we're going to do a lot more after that because I'm sure he's going to be really happy. And then other investors will, you know, see the success that I'm having, and they'll also be interested in participating as well. So I said, hey, you know, let me not be too greedy. Usually, I'm getting, you know, giving away like seven percent, ten percent interest, twelve percent interest. Let me not be too greedy, right? Because <laughs> you get used to it in fix and flips. And let me just really focus more on providing a lot of value to my investor, um, who I'm sure is going to be investing a lot more because we have a, a great, you know, uh, things are going fine. We have a good relationship going, and. I, I could I foresee the project going pretty smoothly mm -hmm. and, you know, now I'm building up my track record, building up my experience as well. And, you know, going into, you know, more exciting developments. Yeah. So what's interesting is, is that um, you're actually, you put me down as a reference. I remember he actually called me because he wanted, because he wanted to understand the, the type of loan. He wanted to understand you. So that was another gap builder that as a resource that, I, I helped speak to him, help him understand it. And, but that's, but basically you, you creatively put it all together. How much? So you had zero money out of pocket, right? On this deal. Yeah. Zero, absolutely zero out of pocket. Yeah. And, you know, Adam from Levine Capital is really just a perfect reference because he's done multiple deals with me. He's a, he's a credible source. He knows exactly the deals that we've done together. Right. So he's not, um, <laughs> he's not going to make up some story or what have you. So he's really a perfect, perfect source. He's a, a, a whole, lender right it's not like joe schmo is like hey call up my cousin you know <laughs> can you take his can you take his word for it right yeah, yeah. it'd be a little biased it's just frankly speaking right yeah even though like for instance i've had uh, a family member invested with me but i'm kind of skeptical i don't i want to give him away last as a reference it's like really my last reference it doesn't hold too much weight in my opinion um so really if you are you know, doing things correctly, right? And you've done a few deals with your lenders, you know, maybe you could use them as a reference. I mean, you know, they're gonna be a credible source compared to like Joe Schmo or a family member, uh, but you could also use like, you know, friends and, and, and things of that nature that are not necessarily uh, your family, it's fine. Uh, but I really couldn't have think of a, a better reference. We've done you know, a good number of deals together. And, um, you know, Adam was honest. He said, hey, look, this is, you know, I've done so-and-so deals with him and, you know, things went fine. And, you know, um, end of the day, we, you know, ended up doing a, a deal together. I think just because of my track record, I'm pretty open book. You know, any question any investor has, I, there's not literally nothing to have. Really open book, you know, anything you want, I'll share it with you. Uh, but really, you know, my experience, my knowledge really comes through when I talk. When I talk to you, you know, I know what I'm talking about, right? Because sure. I've, I've been doing all this stuff like day in, day out as a GC, managing crews, managing day labor, like even doing some things myself, a lot of my hands. So really, you know, like like this guy really knows what he's talking about. So if you're going and you're talking to private investors, you're also learning a valuable skill of how to talk to your to your investors, but also how to communicate effectively and showcase your knowledge you know, if you have, like, if you're pretty knowledgeable, you want to actually, like, tell them, hey, you know, here's some pitfalls to stay away from. Hey, here's some things that could go wrong. You want to know all these things. And then you just, the rest is just uh, effective communication. And it's not too hard to attract capital when you actually, like, have the experience. And it, it just becomes easier and easier and easier and easier as time goes on as you, as you build your track record. So it's kind of like, you know, an exponential, like, a, if you ever look at a parabola, it's really hard to attract capital in the beginning. It's very slow. The more capital you attract, the more experience you get. The more uh, capital you attract, the more it's just kind of uh, really a, it's a domino effect. So I, I can't agree with you more. Too much capital. Yeah. And you're not finding enough deals. So you'll have the opposite problem. Well, that's one thing that's um, that works in your favor because, for example, I get as a lender, I get a lot of um, requests for 100% financing and or whatever, higher leverage to cap funding. And, you know, it may be a great deal, but it may be questionable of the person. I don't know them. Well, you, it comes, I already know, like, your character. Um, 
Oh, we got someone on here. Another one. Wow. Uh, hey. So, so um, basically, we already had a stat established report. We from my other uh, company, we've done deals. So, part of um, underwriting, I don't want to get too into it, but yeah, the four C's is say uh, collateral, capacity, character, capital, right? And I already knew your character, right? Um, Cause you have a great deal and someone that is, that doesn't have good character and that could end up being a horrible deal. So that's the one thing. So it's easy to make a decision. Obviously there's a good deal. It made sense. We like, I, you have great character, right? So that was an easy decision-making on it. Right. Um, so that's why what Joe says, like you, you, uh, when you start out, it may be hard to raise that money. Um, but as you build your track record, it, it will get easier. But obviously, like you, you got to be an open book. You got to communicate very well with your lenders, with your investors. And now, what's happening is um, we could get into that now, where you're transitioning. Um, well, you transitioned into larger projects now. I mean, so you start out with. Um, you know, obviously your projects, the reason, so let me say that, the reason why you qualify for that ground up deal is because it's not, the, the qualify for a ground up uh, construction loan for that was, was a two family, right? If I'm not mistaken, that is duplex that you're building, right? So you progressively showed that your, your budgets were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And those are compensating factors to qualify for that, um, for that loan which is ground up construction, which is considered, it's the, it's the risky type. It's, it's more risky than just buying a, um, in a lender size and just buying a house to renovate it. Right. Um, and now that you're building your track record there, now you, you scaled up into, you said, uh, multifamily development and, uh, flex sure. space. Yeah. And let's talk about how you're putting that there because a new investor to just jump into the, 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 the build, uh, a 200 unit, a part of building, no one's going to part. Well, you're not going to get a loan. Exactly. That's yep. your first deal. Exactly. Exactly. So, so this is, uh, this is yeah. the power of syndications. So you have a, a group of partners together and I'm not going to get too crazy with the lingos, but you have a sponsor, which is someone who has the experience, for instance, right? You have uh, actual, what you call like capital raisers, which help you raise the capital in some cases, on these big deals, you have to raise like five, six million, right? So the 160 unit that we're doing, we're gonna raise like six million on that. But I'm not raising the six million myself, right? I'll raise some of the capital, but we're gonna have a few capital raises together. Mm -hmm. um, so these are what you call like syndications. It's really just putting a group of people together. You have a group of partners, right? You have maybe someone who like found the deal, maybe someone who's the sponsor. They have all the track record. Maybe you have someone who's raising the well, let's step back you mentioned sponsor right so i'm sorry to cut you off because uh i just want to um it it's something like this is normal lingo for you or myself but most people don't even know what a sponsor is um a sponsor is basically the operator they're the one that is they're controlling everything right um now you're starting to get into limited partnerships um so the so you partnered up with another sponsor, right? Because you didn't th th do this type of large project. You didn't have the track record, but you partner up with someone, another good sponsor, and that allowed you to now get that loan and that will help you raise the money because um, they're going to look at the bios, everybody. Okay, well, we have, we have Joe, and then you have another sponsor that has his track record of, doing so many X deals and he could actually qualify to get the senior loan. And, and then you, so I'll let you talk more about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been, you know, networking for the past two years. I knew I was wanting to get into commercial real estate. So I'd spend a little bit of time networking and, you know, putting myself out there and, and, you know, slowly I uh, start building relationships over the past two years. Right. So, you know, I'm dealing with other people that, you know, they've, one guy's done like 4,000 units. One guy's done 1,000 units. Another guy's done 600 units. Uh, so these are, these are like, you know, pretty big people that I'm working with. Another one's done almost like 2,000 units. So, but I've been watering these relationships for the past two years. So it didn't really happen overnight or past year or past few months, depending on which person you're talking about. 
um, or even not not done specifically. I've been now working with a bunch of people that have not worked out, right? I've, you know, went through a lot of deals that I thought would be a good deal, but just didn't have the right partner lined up to really effectively help me close the deal. <laughs> There's mm-hmm. a lot going on in a co- big commercial real estate deal when you have to raise, you know, a million, you need like 200,000 for a deposit and you need this. And um, that's not to say that, you know, I didn't have the wrong, I had the wrong partners or anything, but you're going to have some, you got initially, you're going to have some people that really are not the people that you need to scale. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, you're going to have some pitfalls. So like I had a, a, almost two years ago, or a year and a half ago, I had 82 units under contract in my hometown in Bayonne, New Jersey. I was so excited about, we signed the contract, everything was going. We actually had a JV that I set up with the, with the seller. And we had another guy, I don't, I hate to blame people, but it's just, just what happened. We had another guy that said something to the seller that made him, the seller was like, just very, um, uh, I don't know what, what the thing is, but uh, he just burst out in anger, right? He killed the whole deal. He just cursed, just killed the whole deal. So you have like things like that. And then sometimes you have things where like your whichever partner you picked, yeah, they have some experience, but they're not really able to like help you like, pull the deal together. Mm-hmm. The sponsor you use is actually like, very, very important because uh, the right sponsor really like pulls the deal together in, in a way that you can't even um, – uh, you know, fathom, fathom yourself really. Yeah. So let's, um, I want to jump into more about putting this together. Okay. So why would this sponsor want to speak with you? Was it, um, because you brought the deal to them, like you were controlling the deal and then you were just looking for the partner. Like, how'd you put this together? Yeah. I mean, so in syndication sponsors are looking for deals. Um, because there's a shortage of deals. Even if there's no shortage of deals, they are always looking for some kind of deal. So if you have the deal tied up and you say, and I, I, it's not that simple. I'm not going to lie to you, right? You got to be, you got to know how to network. You got to know how to develop the relationship because it is relationship based. And you got to know your stuff. Because if you're getting an, on a phone call with someone who's done like, let's say 4,000 units and you seem clueless or something like that, or you don't have developed a relationship or, um, you know, frankly, you just, you, you just don't know what you're doing or what, what have you. They're not going to take you as seriously, but I guess it's, it's a little bit hard to say, but there's a lot of like small, minute social details that can help you like attract a sponsor to do a deal with them versus just not doing a deal together at all. Um, just the way you communicate, your background, what kind of deals you've done in the past, your character, how your phone call goes, how you've developed a relationship. There's so many, there's so many different aspects of it that can help you either develop a partner because it's a partnership. You know, you're going to be with someone for a while and over the next two to five years. They're not just going to go with, with anybody. But if you're putting in your homework and you know what you're talking about, you get on a phone call with them, you know how to develop the relationship. They see you know what you're doing. You've, you've done like tons of research. I mean, before I attracted anyone, uh, any like really good sponsors, really good sponsors. Um, um, I probably did you know a year of learning on my own, research, underwriting, writing deals, I know everything like inside. And out. I don't know why there's an echo now, but whatever. The yeah, case I don't know. Is. Yeah, something uh, with the internet, I guess. Uh, oh, okay. So let's see, there's a question. Joe, what markets are you investing in? What's your buy box? So I'm investing in uh, New Jersey. I'm investing in North Carolina. I'm investing in Florida. Um, what we're doing is we're doing uh, multifamily developments. So like 50 units and over, typically speaking. And industrial developments, we're looking for 50K square feet buildable and over. So it could be like five acres or more typically. And then the second question, what resources or advice do you have for anyone coming into the commercial multifamily space? I would say, uh, one, try to do a couple of small deals yourself, in my opinion, because you learn a ton and then you're showing that you are like actually in the game. Uh, I think that helps. As there are some people that just jump straight into commercial real estate, but they typically don't end up learning a lot of the stuff themselves. They come in and they're like, oh, let me just find a deal. Let me just be a deal hunter. Or let me just be a capital raiser. 
but they don't really know the business because if you go and you do a bunch of these fix and flips, a bunch of these developments, a bunch of these small rentals, you're actually learning a business. It doesn't seem like a, 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 a like a big thing, but if you're looking at it, like a hundred unit is a hundred units, right? If you know what I'm talking about, right? So if you're managing a hundred unit property, right? And one shop, that's like you're managing one single family, but just repeat it a hundred times. So you've done it with like one family. What's It's not that big of a difference. It is some differences, right? Right, there's some difference, but you literally have property managed. You've renovated one unit. So if you're renovating a hundred units, yeah, it's a bigger project, but it's the same renovation over and over for a hundred times. So it's really, really important to learn the construction, in my opinion, learn the property management, learn the asset management, get your cuts and bruises, do all the get all your errors out the way with project management, asset management on the smaller deals. So you know what pitfalls to avoid on the bigger deals. I think it's something very important. You get to learn a ton about the business and people take you more seriously because you also know a lot more and you're an operator. Um, so if you're going to the commercial multifamily space, I would say also to learn a lot about underwriting. Uh, it's very, very important. It's probably a couple of courses you could find online, but you want to find. Yeah. Ur Urban, Urban Land Institute is actually, well, that's a good resource if you're looking to get into development and they yeah. have um, they got some courses in there for underwriting and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're going to do like multifamily value add, what I recommend, it's only like 500 bucks. I'm not, uh, I don't get any money from this, but I just recommend them. Multifamily synthesis analyzer. They show oh. you a lot of the details, like filling out the Excel sheet and stuff like that. Uh, they have a pretty good course. Is that Michael Blanc, I believe? No, it's a different person. I don't know his name, but it's a different person. I yeah, know. I've seen these. Um, that's another thing. Are you part of any like um, masterminds? And um, I'm sure you're yeah. a part of some of these, right? So yeah, that's a great of, resource. Yeah. Yes, I join. I join a mastermind. Uh, I'm personally part of the core, which you know I'd recommend for you to join, 100, percent like a thousand percent. And um, it's actually pretty affordable too. It's you know, stay away from the masterminds that want to do twenty five thousand dollars. <laughs> you know, a lot of people go into it; they end up not doing anything. Um, I join a small mastermind, like the, definitely recommend the one I just uh, mentioned. A hundred million percent, I'd recommend it. Uh, so yeah, make sure that you're going into like some kind of small group mastermind, nothing crazy, nothing like very expensive. You want to make sure that. You're in the right mastermind. There's a lot of bad masterminds out there. A lot of people spending 25,000, 10,000, and they're not really getting that much of a return, uh, especially if they don't have any experience. You're going to these masterminds. The mastermind is only as effective as the experience that you have, in my opinion. You're not able to properly leverage the connections there because they kind of see you as this person who doesn't really know what he's doing. They kind of see you as a person that, yeah, they want to do business with me, but like, what reason do I have to, do I have to really do business with them? Uh, but in some cases, you could probably not work. But the, with that experience, it, the, your your dollars are not going to go as far. Mostly, um, to be frank. And but yeah, if you learn the underwriting, if you get really good at capital raising, you could also just focus all in on all in on that. And there's people that just do that for a living. They just the capital raises for a living, <laughs> right? Or you know, they're just uh, find deals, find. Uh, whatever for a living. I didn't want to do that. I've passed on a lot of deals. I've had people I want to say, Hey, you know, come do, you know, this hundred unit to come do this. I didn't want to just be a copper reason. So I wanted to, you know, find a deal. I wanted to actually be an operator too. I like be part of asset management, be part of development. So I see myself as a, as an operator. I see myself as a developer. I don't see myself as a copper reason or anything like that. Or someone who just goes and finds a deal. I've been operating. It's what I've been doing for a while now. Uh, so another question, what was the name of the multifamily product? You suggest? So multifamily synthesis analyzer. Uh, that one's really good for underwriting multifamily value add deals. I'll put up on screen. Multifamily synthesis, synthesis analyzer. analyzer. Yeah. It might also just come up with synthesis analyzer too. Uh, it's like 500 bucks or something like that. It's not cheap. There's also some courses on Udemy. You can do multiple courses together. Give me, give me yeah. one second. I'm gonna let the dog out. He, I think he sees someone. Give me a second, please. Hold on.
We're back. Sorry about that, everybody. Sorry, uh, I have a little mini golden doodle working from home, and he saw someone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is very interesting. So basically what you're saying is you're, you want to be an operator. So you help find the deals, right? You you develop relationships with sponsors by joining. So, you know, you're filling in gaps. Um, how do you find a sponsor? Um, you join a mastermind, right? And from what I understand, I'm just talking to a lot of people that are in this realm. Um, the benefit of Jordan Mastermind is because you have a lot of resources and everybody has different skills. Um, you're you're more analytical. You like to study numbers. You actually like to do all the, the spreadsheets and analyze. And, and not everybody has that skill set. You don't want to. Um, and so by joining that mastermind, you fill in gaps. You have um, resources. Uh, you learn how to find deals. And you have resources as finding that sponsor that um, has that track record. So you could obtain a loan from uh, whatever, uh, a bank or from uh, private equity or a private debt fund, whatever it is. Um, then you're looking for um, investors. And actually what's interesting is you may have investors in that mastermind as well that are willing to put up capital. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's always going to be investors there. So it's actually like, you know, I talked to this one investor. He's like, I got three million. I said, another guy. I have three and a half million. Another guy. I have like a couple million. So there's tons of tons of people there. Uh, you want to make sure that you know if it's like a Facebook group, you make sure you're putting yourself out there, posting, you know, showing up to the to the meetings. If it's online, Zoom meetings. If it's in person, it's really really important to network properly. Just be really be, be a people's person, right? You just want to, you know, get to know the person, chat with them, chat about their goals, chat about what you're doing, a little bit about yourself. But yeah, I mean, before before the mastermind, you know, I would also say, get a, try to attract a mentor too, right? So, I mean, mm. my mentor, for instance, he's, you know, he's built a few hundred units, he's been a builder for like three decades. And actually there, um, uh, he's a good friend of mine and we're, we're looking for deals together too, but uh, it's been tough finding a couple of a couple of these deals, but um, you know, he he's now you know he's his company bought got bought out um, uh, pretty pretty substantial. Now, I don't want to mention names right now, but they're like a billion dollar company, right? They have like this huge uh, huge company. Uh, they got they got bought out, but um, you know I've learned a ton from him because he's actually like mm -hmm. built a big uh, a big business for for engineering. Uh, he had, you know, a big business with uh, building as well, uh, which is, uh, and, you know, I was able to learn a ton from someone like him. And, you know, now I'm not just, you know, a no-name developer, emerging developer. I actually have someone who's in my corner. So you want to be able to form relationships with other people um, that have done it before, you know, not necessarily looking for sponsors, I would say. And it, it's just going to happen. It's going to happen. If you're putting yourself out there, I was, you know, really active, you know, I was putting in 100, 120 hour work weeks in, in real estate, doing all these, doing all these flips, you know, conversation sparked, you know, I've, I've, in my opinion, I, I, um, I'm a good communicator, at least I, I like to think so, or just because I come off as genuine. And I mean, you, you, you stated something about my character and, you know, I think the reason is I'm genuine. I'm open, open book. I like to do good by people. Uh, but, you know, people will be attracted to you uh, depending on, you know, the work that you're putting in, depending on, you know, they'll, they'll notice, they'll notice you're doing some hard work. You know, you're up and coming, you're emerging. They kind of want to work with you as well. So what books and habits do you recommend for entrepreneurs in real estate game? Okay. That's a good one. Hmm. Um, there's a ton of books out there. Uh, if you want to get really excited about real estate, there's a, a book by uh, Sam Zell. Um, mm. That's really, really good. Um, that really just is an, his autobiography. And uh, you could look it up, the Sam Zell autobiography. And there is, um, um, it's not coming to my mind right now, but Atomic Habits is a really good oh, one. Atomic, Atomic Habits. Habits is a good one. I personally got my... Um, uh, start in my opinion, like the whole self development world from Anthony Robbins, Unlimited Power, because he talks about like controlling your mind mm. and he talks about like specific strategies, you know, like visualizations, auditory, kinesthetic, all these different ways you could try to trick your brain, get into powerful states, 
that's in my opinion, this is what opened my eyes. Like, Hey, you can kind of really trick yourself into success. If you're, you're more thinking at that time is not really about success. There's a couple of techniques in there to change your personality. In my opinion, it had a big effect on me personally. So I want to, I really recommend uh, particularly the later chapters. Uh, he gets into like specific techniques you can try. Yes. Thank you so much, Anthony. Am I being <laughs> Thank you. You're amazing. That's the name I was thinking about. This is a great, great, amazing read. And it's actually uh, very motivational. Since, you, since it's on top of my mind, I'll probably give it a second read. It's really good. Really yeah, good. I, I reread books. I even get the, I'll read the book. I'll get the audible. Because you, know, you, you forget. For, yeah. For, for people that don't know, Sam Zell is literally the person that like pioneered real estate the way it's mm -hmm. done now. The commercial is literally the bi pioneer this guy has many many billions in real estate uh he had, he had he actually like started the whole REIT thing it wasn't even a thing before him he's done a lot of things that paved the way for all the real estate investors and mm -hmm. he's referenced a lot by a lot of you know big investors now too um so he's 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 this guy's like a household name yeah, he would do he would do things investors. that everybody else frowned upon and everybody's going one way he would go the other way and they're like whoa that actually worked out like um he was known for what was it uh I'm trying to think. Um, what was he known for again? I'm drawing a blank. The putting big deals together. I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes over a lot of details about how he pulled like some of the deals together. It's really just his rise is just fascinating. It's yeah, I'm just drawing a blank on. Um, it was it um affordable. It was uh, shoot, what was it again? Um, uh, he's done a lot of things, so it could be anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, whatever. It's it. He's not It'll come to me when we get off here. So we're about to wrap up um, very soon. So, so going back to uh, you know the gator gapping, like everything trans. So you have a starting point, and everything you know. If you're flipping houses, obviously you, you like at, you know, Tony Robbins, great resource. More, um, you know, you gotta you gotta have the head. You gotta be mentally strong. You gotta have. You talk about visualization. You gotta have. You gotta be able to. Um, he's he's awesome love tony robbins and then you know obviously there's a lot of books um for me i well one thing i did is i went to graduate school i got a master of real estate um it look it was great but you actually learn a lot more by doing as well because a lot of that's textbook and i mean i could i could ace a real estate development course until you actually get into the trenches then you you're branding yourself you're you know and and you're you're attracting money because you're putting yourself out there and the grave dancer. Yep. Okay. That's what they call <laughs> and um, <laughs> he's done a then, lot of uh, acquisitions to like just bring in like businesses from the dead. So they, they call yeah. Them. And then um, you know, so now you're fast forward. Now you're you're I mean, you're still doing the flips, but now you're transitioning into bigger type of projects, which has the same philosophy. You still got to brand yourself. You still you know, Grant Cardone, for example, he's you know. I believe he's a billionaire, but he's still raising money from um, passive investors, right? OPM. And now you're you're putting all these resources together. You said that you have um, your GC, you have the pro discount at um, at uh, Home mm -hmm. Depot. You have the business credit card. I'm sure you're putting your materials or in, on the the Home Depot credit card, not on your personal credit card. And you're talking about now you're scared of now you're talking about syndications. You may not have the track record for that, but you're going to build your track record because you're partnering with someone with a track record. And now by doing that, be, be, becoming a guarantor or you're the general partner on the deal, you, you you're now that will count as your track record for the next deal. So eventually you won't need another partner. You could do it on your own eventually. Um, and you, and then this could be another segment we can get into about, um, it's too much to get into right now. Like you, you, you're, you're forming, you know, uh, you go into the syndication model. You have the limited partner, you have the general partner, and and uh, and I mean that's another way. Actually, if you want to learn, um, it just came to my head. It, I know investors that um, they got into, uh, let's say, um, commercial uh, multifamily. When we say commercial, we're talking about you know, one to four is. is um, is considered uh, uh, residential, and then you get into the, the the five plus. Now you're in commercial, even though it's res, um, residential. But um, and what's happening is now you're you're 
you're getting into another avenue where you're blending um, private capital, but it's in the form of uh, limited partnerships. And let me step back. So if you want to learn by by getting involved, you could actually start off by investing as a limited partner just to to get your feet wet, to actually learn the process. I know people, that's how they start out as well. They'll come in as a limited partner, meaning they're passive, but you could still, with the right sponsor, you could still learn a lot being about, and they'll, they'll, they'll help educate you what's going on. So you learn eventually. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, any more questions? I know, um, I know we have, um, you know, we're running out of time. I know Joe's got to get back to it, everybody. And, um, you have any tidbits for people, um, that, uh, that you want to share before we let, before we, we go. Um, I would say just keep persistent because you're going to fail over and over. You're going to keep looking for deals. And if you think it's like an easy thing, like, oh, let me just go for look for a deal. No, it took me, you know, a year looking through deals. <laughs> so but you want to be persistent. Don't underestimate how much time it truly takes. I mean, just looking for deals, and then underwriting the deals, which is, you know, a whole thing on its own. You could spend in some cases, a couple of months, just trying to go through the Excel sheet, trying to learn the ins and outs and every little thing and looking at the formulas. It's, it, it's a lot. It's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So I would say be persistent, be patient, just know that, you know, whatever you do, like real estate is a get rich for sure, not a get rich quick game. Uh, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take five, 10 times more effort than what you probably think. Uh, there are some people that just, you know, they – it just clicks with them or maybe they're a little bit lucky or what have you mm -hmm. But uh, on average it's going to take you a lot of work and if you underestimate how much work it's going to take you're you'll never get started so try to in my opinion it's easy for me to say but should i just try to put like three hours after after work whatever you're done your your, your day job or what have you if you have a full-time job of learning every single day or two hours or one hour just whatever it is just but just be consistent because it's easy to have a goal of like getting into real estate if you're not in it yet or transitioning to high, bigger deals. It's easier to get into these goals, but they never really materialize. Um, so I would say just focus on learning every single day and then just being patient. And the best way you could learn is by actually looking for deals, underwriting them, and then doing small fix and flip deals. I think that's the best way you could learn. And I'm just watching a lot of actual um, um, like what would they call like pitch deck meetings and, and mm -hmm. things like that where they're going over um, uh, potential like syndication deals. You could go through the pitch deck, right? Or you could ju join a Zoom session if they have one and you could even invest as a limited partner and you're lear literally learning or just being an investor and getting paid. So this is a really, really good way to, to learn. And also another way you can get into the game is just, just JVing. I've had people say, Hey, Joe, I want to JV with you, but plenty of people I want to JV with you just because I want to learn. Okay. Like here, you know, take the capital, deploy into this deal. Um, you know, not that I take their capital, it gets deployed straight away to a title company or what have you, or they deposit it with the, uh, as a down payment. But, um, you know, they're going to go in with you or you, you're going to go in with an investor, an experienced investor. You say, Hey, I want to be a GP on this deal, or I want to be an LP on this deal, or I want to be a JV on this deal. And in return, I want you to teach me as much as you, as you can. So. And, uh, and for people, uh, JV means joint venture. Be like, oh yeah, sure. I mean, if you're putting up like this much capital, you have a million dollars or whatever. And, and maybe your sole investor in one deal. So you Probably, especially if they're now like a really big developer. Like, yeah, like, yeah. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, thank you. So I just want to just let you guys know we updated the site. When you go to it now, if you if you ever need a quick quote, it takes less than five minutes, right? All you got to do is just click this. Boom. Pops up. And let's say you want to do a fix and flip. You just choose fix and flip. You could just submit your desired leverage. You put 100% and then we'll analyze it. That's why I know what you do. And keep in mind, resources we have, right? We have the request proof of funds. We don't charge for the proof of funds. So it's automated. Um, I know you used it recently, um, I believe. Um, yeah, I, you used it. And so we're making updates. And also, 
keep in mind too, if you ever need to, uh, if you ever want to have a question, feel free to go to the chat box. Okay. Um, if you try to call me, if I don't answer, just go to the chat box and you'll be able to get a hold of myself or one of our team members. And if you have any resources like you need, it's in here. Um, how can I get a hold of you? So three different ways, a couple different ways. Uh, you could get a hold of me on just via my email, Joel at Spartan Investments dot info. You could reach me in Instagram, invest with Joe Sparta. You could reach me on Facebook, facebook.com slash Joe Sparta 300. Um, those are the main ways you can reach me and I'm happy to answer any questions or, you know, have any discussions. Okay, great. So I gotta, I gotta, I know you have to go. I got a closing. I got people, calling. <laughs> I gotta get back to them. But anyway, everybody, um, thank you so much for joining us. Please like, subscribe, share our videos. Please uh, comment. Let us know what topics you want to talk about. We're not done with this segment. This segment is going to keep on going because it there's a plethora of topics. We'll have other guests. Joe, thank you for joining us. I Thanks appreciate you joining yeah. us. And, um, yeah, we're going to get together soon. I know uh, the weather is nice now. Uh, well, it was raining before. It's a little sunny. And we're actually, um, before we go, well, you know, we're going to have a, um, a walkthrough at his um, – I forgot the address already in my head, but the one in Newark that the ground up deal, we're gonna once you get the framing up foundation, we're gonna actually go there and talk more about that deal, how you, you know, how you found the deal, how you put it together, blending um institutional with private capital or whatnot. We're gonna do that. So everybody, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Joe. You. Adam, for having you. Take care. All the best. Thank you. Bye bye.